All right, I uh, guess I'm not going too far. I'm tethered to the table at the moment, so that's fine. <laughs> Might be getting in front of the screen. Um, so this, this talk is all about how to choose a theme, um, which when you start looking at the theme you want for your site, I mean, it's a pretty important decision. One, it, it is how your site is going to look. So it's going to be the impression, first impression for most people of your site. And like it or not, that first impression is going to translate into people's impression of you and your products and services. So you want to get it right. Um, and with you know multiple thousands of themes out there, it is a big job to try and come up with the right one for your site. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, what is a theme? Um, I think, does anyone here not understand the concept of a theme? No, we all get that. Effectively, themes are responsible for the laying out of the content of your site. Um, they should only provide core functionality, and this is where a lot of themes get it wrong. We see a lot of themes, uh, especially on some of the theme repositories, that just try and pack every single feature they possibly can into the theme itself. And what happens is you end up not only with a big bloated theme that can slow your site down, but it also sort of locks you into that theme because the functionality is built in. If you change theme, you lose all that functionality. So the way that WordPress was initially designed, I guess, and still pretty well runs, is that theme should def uh, provide all of the the code to display your content and all the functionality should be separate, either in your plugins or, or, or stuff like that. Um, however, some of the good themes, I guess, provide styling within their style sheets for the popular plugin. So, you know, there are certain plugins that a lot of people use, and especially, especially within some of the framework um, functionalities. There are certainly, like in the Genesis space, there's a lot of plugins that just about every Genesis site will use. So a good theme built for that framework will already provide the, the styling for those plugins such that when you put that plugin in and you put it in, into your sidebar or into one of your widget spaces, it's going to look right and straight out of the box. So you don't have to go and style everything from scratch every time you add another plugin. All right, so getting on to the choosing a theme. So how do we actually go about this process? Well. I generally suggest that you start with the objective of your site. So before you even go and look at a theme, before you even think about which sites you're going to go and look at the themes, think about what you want your site to do. Okay, is it, a, is it going to be just a blog? Is it going to be um, promoting your products and services? Is it going to be you know, a community space? What is it that you're trying to achieve with your site? And once you're clearer about what you're trying to achieve, then when you start looking at themes, you can very quickly rule them in or out based on whether they're going to meet that objective. <clears throat> so yeah, as we've got the information blog style site will have quite a different requirement for its theme than the, you know, something that's trying to sell a single product or service. And again, something that's trying to be, you know, a promotion for your whole business. All right, so once we've decided what our site is trying to achieve, the other thing that I haven't got here is you need to think about who is your target market, okay? Um, this will get more important once we get to the actual visual side of things, but it's also another one that you want to consider up front. You know, if you're targeting 20 to 30-year-old females, that's a totally different market than a you know, 50-year-plus 50, 50 male who's looking at retirement coming along soon or something like that. So you've got to be cognizant not only of what your message is, but who you're trying to deliver it to, so that you get that right fit as well. When you do start looking at the actual themes, you need to look at the layout first, okay? And I know this can get very, very hard when you're presented with all these visuals running at you in all the theme demos, but what you've got to try and do is look past the pretty pictures that they're, they're putting in front of you and look at, okay, how is this site laid out? Well, this one's got a full width header or it's got you know, a sidebar down one side or it's got this number of widget spaces on the home page and that sort of thing. So start looking at the blocks that are on the, on the theme and thinking about, well, what would, what would you put in that block for your site? Okay, and if you can't come up with something that you would put in that block, that's okay, sometimes you can just delete the blocks and, and skip over that one, but if you have trouble visualizing how you're gonna fit all of your content and what you wanna say into those blocks, then you've got the wrong theme and just move on, okay? Uh, so as I said, look past the pretty pictures. Okay, it's gotta be responsive. If you're developing a site these days and you're not developing it on a responsive theme, 
um, you, you're in for a world of hurt. As we just heard, you know, Google's coming out with a, a algorithm update on April 21 that's basically going to penalise sites in the rankings on mobile search if your site is not responsive. So, you know, we've all seen the stats and they vary wildly, but everyone knows that browsing on mobile devices is on the up and it's either closing in on or surpass browsing on desktop devices, depending on who you listen to. So a good portion of your market is going to be looking at your site on a mobile device, be that a phone, a tablet or whatever, um, but you better be serving them something that's, you know, looks good and is functional for them, okay? So, so it, it's not good enough anymore just to have your whole site scaled down onto a smaller screen. People's fingers are too big to press links like that. So you've got to have a site and a theme that is going to adjust depending on the device size and present a usable and, and aesthetically pleasing result on that device. Um, the other thing to, to look at when you're looking at it, and again, this is a visual thing that you've got to try and get past, but colors and fonts on the site are probably the easiest things to change. So if you're looking at a, a theme and it, you know, it's got the right blocks and you think, oh, but I don't like those pictures and the, the black is too dark and, you know, I really want something a bit lighter, a bit of, bit of an area of feel, and those fonts just don't work together, then that's still an option for you because, you know, with a little bit of uh, CSS code in the style sheet, it's very easy to change those things. Um, Google has the most amazing array of fonts that you can put into websites and it's very, very easy to do that these days. Um, there's also a number of sites you can go to that will give you suggested font pairings and you can actually visually see the way that the fonts will change the look of a site. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of people will get hung up on this and they go, oh, but I don't like that font. That's really no reason to rule a theme out. Um, and the one that's sort of blocked down the bottom, it's actually images are the easiest things to change. So again, as I was saying, if you don't like the images that are on the theme demo, that's not a worry at all. You swap out a couple of images, put in some fresh images, can completely change the feel of the site. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is try and look past the pictures that you're seeing when you look at a theme demo and really try and look at that structure and does it meet what you're trying to achieve with your site. If the structure's right, you can change the rest. If the structure's wrong, it doesn't matter what you do to it, it's still not going to look right. Um, or it's going to be a very hard slog to get that structure right. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned at the start, don't get swayed by the features. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of the, the the themes that are promoted out there, and especially some on Theme Forest, I know they get a bit of a bad rap for this, but it is true. There is a lot of themes out there that will say, you know, 50 color options and 200 layout options, and we've got this built in and a portfolio built in and some other custom post type and all this stuff built in. And you know, on the surface, it sounds great. It's like, oh wow, it's so flexible, it must have everything I want. And then you start working with it, and it's like, well, how the heck do I configure that for what I need? And it starts to become a bit of a struggle to, to configure it. And then you go, well, geez, I've had enough. I'll go to something else. The minute you try and change out of that theme, all of that functionality is locked in the theme and it's all gone. Okay, so when you ch go to change to something that is leaner, that is more suited to what you want to actually do, you've got to rebuild all that functionality using plugins or or custom code or whatever, but you've got to start from scratch again. So just be very, very careful if you're looking at one of those themes that is promoting itself as, you know, the be all and end all, the Swiss army knife of, of themes effectively. Um, as I mentioned before, functionality really should be implemented in plugins. That way, if you do need to change your theme, your functionality goes with it. You don't have to start from scratch again. You might have to restyle some of the, some of the stuff, but the functionality will all be there. Um, and the other reason why you don't want these themes that have got everything in it is because that's a lot of code to do everything, um, which means your theme is going to run slower because it's got to check you know, so many, are you using this, are you using that, are you using something else? And there's all of this code that runs just to see if it has to display something or not. Um, and if it does have to display it, then there's more code that runs again. So you know, your whole page load time goes down the toilet. Some other things to think about when you are choosing a theme. Um, some of these are a little bit harder to assess, but the code quality is a big one you really want to try and assess. Now, 
not all of us here are code geeks and can read through the whole set of code and, and know what's good and bad. So the way you would sort of get at this is go online on Google and just do a search and see what other people are saying about the, the theme. Um, you know, you only have to type in the theme name and review and you'll get masses of results and you can get a feel pretty quickly for what other people think of that theme. Now, be warned with this, obviously it is the internet, anyone can say anything, so don't just take the first article you see as gospel, try and get the overall feel. You know, if you're getting a lot of positive articles and a few negative, then it's probably okay. If you're getting a lot of negative and a few positive, probably move on to the next one. Security is something that should be built into the theme. Okay, you, you certainly don't want a, a theme that is known to have security leaks and people getting hacked on that theme regularly. Um, again, you're not going to be able to, to work this one out yourself. This is where you have to go and do the research again and just see, you know, type in the theme name and security issues or something like that and you'll probably see if there's any coming up or if there's any concerns around it. Um, some of the bigger frameworks will advertise who they've had that has done security reviews on their code. Something like that should give you some sort of comfort. Um, you know, if someone's serious enough about their code to give it a, to a security expert and say, hey, go and try and pick my theme apart, then they're pretty confident in, in the security of that theme. A lot, of the, a lot of themes will actually build in some basic SEO support. Now this is one that sort of gets into that gray area of should it be in the theme, should it be functionality um, is through plugins. <clears throat> but these days SEO is sort of, you need to have the base level pretty well for any site. You know, if you choose to take it further with a, a plugin like Yoast or something like that, that's fine. But out of the box, your theme should at least address the minimum requirements that Google is expecting. So your meta descriptions, your page titles, um, your URLs, obviously WordPress will handle for you. Um, but just some of that basic support like that. <clears throat> and I guess we do want something that's flexible and extensible. So most themes will not stop you from using uh, particular function uh, plugins and things like that. But just be careful, if it does have stuff built in, it could well conflict with other things. And again, we can go back to SEO here. Some themes have SEO functionality built in, and if you try and put, the, put a Yoast plugin, they will clash and it won't work. Whereas a lot of other themes will automatically recognize that these better plugins are installed and turn off their internal SEO functionality and just let the plugin take over. Um, again, sometimes a little bit hard to assess before you use a theme, but maybe that some of these are the sort of checks you should do when you first install a theme before you start getting too deep into actually customizing it. Just run some basic checks like that. Sure. If you, if you find a theme, sorry to interrupt, <coughs> I was just going to say to someone who was talking about it, if you find a theme that you really like but you're not sure of you know, whether it does this or that, don't be afraid to you know, send an email to the developer. Like, Theme Forest is a little. Um, um, uh, um, Contact. Yeah, sending like, options, uh, sending comments to the developers, um, and every theme site, site is going to get a contact notice. So, if it's something like as Warren just sort of mentioned about, say, it's, it, you know, mentions talking about SEO or something, and you're not sure whether it's turned off when you if you install Yoast or something like that, send them an email. They, you know, they'd be more than happy to help you to say yes, it does this or no, it doesn't or whatever. You know, it's, much better than sending a quick email than spending a few bucks and finding, you know, oh, it doesn't do what, what, what I thought it did, so, you know. Yeah, good point. Um, also on Sorry. that, no, 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 great, that, that was a really good point. Um, also, another benefit of doing that is you start to get a feel for their support before you actually buy the theme as well. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this comes back to <clears throat> the functionality versus display type argument. My personal opinion was it would be that I wouldn't have the e-commerce functionality built into the site. I'd have it styled within the, within the theme, but I'd have the functionality provided by a recognised e-commerce plugin like a WooCommerce or or something else. What were those, those 
Uh, WooCommerce is probably one of the bigger e-commerce uh, plugins for for WordPress. There's a number of others as well. So, yeah, it's not that I'm promoting them over someone else. It's just the one that I'm familiar with. Um, you can find a number of other plugins, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, use a plugin to develop uh, to to deliver the e-commerce functionality, but get a theme that is styled to support that plugin you're going to use. And again. There are a lot of themes that are built with WooCommerce styling built in. I'm not aware of any that do, like where you would present them with a theme and say, hey, can you review the code of this? No. <clears throat> Yeah, the popular ones. Yeah, look, um, I'm not aware of any, but then I just haven't searched for that. Amelia, Anthony, D. I'm just checking. Um, yeah, there is a site called ThemeCheck.org. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you can upload things to that, so that you know requires you having, yeah, having already purchased it. Yeah. But there are also the, the database of other people who've uploaded some of the things, so you can kind of jump on there and have a quick look. And well, there you go. Oh, well, there you go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call their results 100% accurate necessarily because uh, you're uploading a zip file and how often the theme is built may return the results. Yeah. But there's other sites that you can download and then you can see how it's been used. Yeah. You can see the results and then you can have a look at what you've done and see how it's been used. So is that an automated code checker type thing or is that someone yeah, manually no, looks over it? Basically, I think it's basically an automatic running of the WordPress theme check plugin. Ah, oh, okay. It's still on the theme check plugin. Okay. Well, that, that would be a good start at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and also if you have uh, the popular plugin, you can work around with it. There are a few plugins that I think is one of the plugins. Okay, cool. All right, there you go. That answers that question. <laughs> um, all right, frameworks versus themes. Um, framework is essentially a parent theme, for want of a better word, but it, it basically, um, I'll, I'll use the Genesis example because that's the one I'm used to. Genesis itself, if you install Genesis and nothing else, will be very, very vanilla theme, okay? But what the Genesis theme, or the framework does, is basically it handles all of the functionality, the core functionality of the theme. And that way, when you get the child theme that's built on that, um, <clears throat> it really, the child theme just has to handle the display and the styling. There's really not much it has to do in terms of page templates unless it wants something particularly different. Um, uh, you know, the, the framework provides all the APIs to hook into and just uh, the theme developer has very little work to do to actually turn out an end theme that you would then use to style your site. Um, the other benefit of a, a framework, I guess, is that the core functionality remains the same and you have a range of themes that you can use across that. So, for instance, if you chose a theme that you were using <clears throat> and your, your requirements changed and you saw a new one come out that looked better for what you want to do, then you could change to that theme and all of the core functionality is still there and, and, and most of it will just work across it. A lot of your styling remains the same, etc., etc. So. I mean, we've all heard the whole you should never really develop on a theme, you should always develop on a child theme, or your customizations, etc., so that, uh, you know, if you upgrade the theme, then your ch custom changes don't disappear. Well, in the case of a framework, it's the framework that gets updated with any new functionality, and the, the, the theme itself, or the child theme, rarely gets changed, um, because it really is just a, a styling thing. And so, the way that I like to think about frameworks and parenting <coughs> Framework is like your iPhone. That's the core functionality. Everybody that has an iPhone has the same you know, technology inside. They need to build that child thing is like your iPhone cover. You manage to find a little bit more unique and less like everybody else's. Yeah, it's, that's a great analogy, actually. Really good analogy. Uh, you know, you say about not unique. I mean, obviously, if you're a, a framework, if you change the theme, the child, mm -hmm. but you still not in the framework, you could go back to another theme, you know, a non framework. 
Well, well, you can, depending on the framework you've got and how much is functionality is built into the framework. Yeah. Um, so Genesis, for instance, is a pretty lean framework. It doesn't have a lot of functionality built into it. So it's not like it's got, you know, 15 custom post types and, um, you know, 2,000 short codes or something that you're going to lose if you move. Um, but some of the others might. I can't speak for all frameworks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh, there would still be some stuff that if you move to a non-Genesis theme, you would potentially have to redevelop, yes. Certainly a lot of your styling would go out the window for some of your plugins. Um, so as I said, the frameworks can be updated without affecting the actual display on your site. So all of this custom styling that you put in place, like if you change your fonts, if you change your colours or you change your images, they're all going to remain when you upgrade the framework. Now, where do you find themes? Well, of course, the WordPress repository is, is probably one of the first places you could start. Um, I've lost the latest count there. What's it up over 4,000 by now or something? Yeah, <laughs> massive. It, it really is a massive repository of themes. Um, you can search through it by different functionality you want, two column, three column, colors, things like that to try and narrow it down. But it's certainly a big job to go through there if you wanted to go through and check them all. <clears throat> Um, you know, and again, because they're free themes, quality varies, uh, but you might just find the one that you're looking for. If you're very clear about what you want, how you want it laid out, etc., it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, probably one of the biggest uh, non-free repositories, ThemeForest. Probably everyone's heard of that one. Uh, again, I've lost track of how many are in there, but again, a vast array of possible themes within there. <clears throat> and of course, there's a whole bunch of other premium theme providers as well, Studio Press, which we've been talking about with the Genesis framework, iThemes uh, have a number of themes, Headway, Thesis, the list goes on. So, um, you know, if you Google WordPress themes or premium WordPress themes, you'll come up with thousands of results. So there's never going to be any lack of choice, that's for sure. All right, any questions around themes and how to choose the right one for you? Mm Mm-hmm. You just don't know. Yeah, and, and look, that is another benefit of the, the frameworks, like the Genesis, the Headways, the, uh, those sort of guys. They've been in business a long time. It is their core business. They've established strong communities around them, so it's not just the company themselves that is putting all this stuff out, but there's a massive amount of people that have bought these themes that are banding together to help each other. So even if the company itself went out of, out of business, you'd have a whole bunch of support still there. Um, my personal opinion, yes, it's certainly worth spending the money to get a premium theme if you're planning to make a business out of this, but um, yeah, it's a personal preference. I mean, sometimes you find even in WordPress report, <coughs> you look at the theme and then you look at the author and then see, you know, just research all the many other things they have, you know, are there like a fabric kind of place that's just sort of long things and they kept yeah, it is. The the only thing I mention is, um, it, it's good to do the background on the author yeah. and how yeah. long they've been around, how recently the theme's been updated, how many times it's been downloaded, reviews, and that sort of thing. I wouldn't necessarily rule a theme out because it's the only theme that the developer's done. It may be that that's the only one they want to do. It may be that that's the only one they think they've got the time to support and they'd rather put their effort into supporting that than creating a whole bunch of themes. So I wouldn't use the number of themes they've got as a selector, but certainly how often it's updated and reviews and things like that, yeah, definitely. Yeah. When it comes to the point where you're going to change a theme, even from the same premium provider, mm -hmm. is there a way of testing? I think they are bring something into WordPress now. Is there a way of testing it out what it looks like, checking all the functionality, especially because 
Yeah, after a year or two, it gets quite complex. Yep. You spend a lot of time evolving this art. And then you think, well, time for an upgrade, time for change. This yeah. There is a plugin, I've uh, forgotten the name, but someone can remind me, There's a where you can have one theme showing to the public and you can basically test another theme. The last time I looked at that one though, it doesn't, doesn't work with the widgets properly, or it didn't at that point. They may have updated, but basically you couldn't move widgets around in the, the thing you're testing because it would move them on the live site as well. Uh, <clears throat> That's how I would normally do it. I would make a copy of my site onto a local host or a development server, play with it. When I'm happy with it, migrate it back up. So how would you do the, the copy? Have you sort of cloned your site somehow? And then yeah, something like a backup buddy or there's a yeah. few other plugins like that. Um, there was one presented here a couple of, couple of months ago. Um, so yeah, just do a, get one of those that will pick it up and move it over onto another domain for you. Develop it and then use the same thing to move it back. There you go. Is there a um, speed advantage of buying a theme that's got five <coughs> commercial plugins embedded, or you have a theme and add them? It's fast or slow? Depends on the quality of the code. Um, if you're yeah. The same code, the if, if, if all things were equal, it would probably be slightly faster to be within the theme because they can make some assumptions about what the theme supports and what it doesn't mm. support. Um, they don't have to put as many, you know, edge case tests around it as a plugin would have to do to be bulletproof. Um, but that said, there's a lot of you know very well written plugins and some pretty average code in themes. So uh, there's not a blanket statement that covers that. You'd have to test it. That's probably the biggest one, is, is price. If you want something custom built for you, um, then it's going to take a lot more effort for the developer to, to basically build it the way you want it. If you... Um, well, go, going the theme route doesn't preclude you from actually getting a designer to design something for you and then look at the layout of that and try and match that layout as close as you can to a off-the-shelf theme and then customize that theme with your your design, which is <coughs> generally how I work. Um, rather than build the whole thing from scratch and try and you know, implement each of the boxes, just look for something that's got the box layout pretty much the same and that you can put your your design over the top of. And if it's the same price, then you would go rather someone to develop it for that same? Um, well, you, you, I don't think you'll ever get it for the same price. That's the thing. If you get someone to custom develop a theme for you, it's going to be a lot more expensive than a theme off the off the rack. I mean, the premium themes, you're looking at about fifty to hundred dollars for the theme, and then time time and effort to customize to your requirements. So if you get a developer to do it for you, it could be anywhere from a few hundred to a couple of thousand tops. You get but someone to. It's the big difference between custom and theme, yeah. Um, but then also you've got to trust the the guy that's custom coding a theme too. Um, so if you trust him, that's great. <laughs> there is that as well. You know, as WordPress moves on, is that custom theme going to be updated by the developer or is he basically, that's done, walk away? So there's, there's a few issues to consider with custom versus theme. Custom theme, you can get exactly what you want though as well. Yeah, that is the upside. With a, a, a premium theme or a purchase theme, then you might buy one that you like the look of, um, or you might find one that, well, yeah, it looks good, but yeah, I don't like this. So, you know, whether you put up with that or whether you get a change more of that, that is you know, up to you. So yeah. The pros and cons are going either way. The one thing I would say is very rarely will you take a theme as it's uh, bought and just put that on your site and leave it like that. I have never seen really anyone, certainly no one I've worked with or talked with, that has been happy 100% with the theme demo. There's always some customization, whether that be changing the, the fonts or the colors or moving some blocks around or something. You know, there's always something you want to do to make it a little bit different to what come off the, off the shelf. Um, yeah. Any other questions or we'll move on to the next presentation? Cool.
using a premium theme at the moment. Yep. Okay. So, happy with your choices? Is everyone happy with their theme that they have? Because it's one of those things that, you know, you, it really, you are tied to a lot of what your theme has to offer. So it's a big decision to make. And um, I agree with sort of what Warren was saying. It's definitely, you know, when you're sort of coming to like a web project, the options your theme has, the quality of your theme, but not only does it give you, um, you know, performance, accessibility, uh, SEO and from a, a search engine point of view, it does actually make a big, a pretty big difference. So, um, but apart from all that stuff, uh, menus. So it's something that if someone is to say to me, you know, Chris, I want to get some, you know, more traffic, I'm publishing a lot of content, but it's really not sort of working out for me. Um, one of the sort of first things that I look at is their information architecture of their site, which depends a lot on their menu structure. So not only from a search engine point of view, but also from visitors. Uh, we've all been to sites where we're looking for things and we have to hunt and search, and especially if people are, you know, on mobile devices, um, it's just something that's not going to happen. So the usability of your site, the user experience, depends a lot on your menus. So it's not a very sort of cool topic, but hey, it's um, something that's essential and it's a big part of, um, you know, a well-built site. So here's a quick outline. Um, it's a sort of quick talk, but, you know, the importance of user experience, uh, you know, the impact of your theme, and we talk about, again, uh, sort of to continue what Warren was saying, it's a very important decision to make up front. And because we're all using WordPress, we have the ability to quite easily add a new theme. And that's something that, you know, is pretty powerful. So we may as well make use of that um, and, you know, make sure we've chosen the right one. Uh, menu options, creating pages and ordering pages, uh, creating a WordPress menu for your theme, how to add custom links, categories, and then also uh, widgets, and a couple of notes on some plugins. So there are also, using plugins, you can actually extend menu functionality if you want something a little bit uh, non-standard or something a little bit more than what WordPress out of the box offers. Okay, so I put this in there too, um, even though Amelia mentioned it. Um, is anyone thinking of going in this room? It's coming up pretty quickly. Um, it's affordable. Um, it's a great couple of days of, um, of learning. Uh, you have some very passionate developers. Um, I'd highly recommend, if you've got a chance to come along, uh, to come along and um, geek out on WordPress. Okay. So the importance of user experience, it can't be underestimated. This is one of the, you know, like I said, in terms of low-hanging fruit, one of the things that if people say you can only do one thing with a site that, you know, needs some work, what would it be? Usually the structure of the site and the structure of the information is probably one of the first things that, that I would look at. And especially in a rebuild, it's one of the things that, that I kind of look at because you've got perfect opportunity to present your information and your, your main areas, your main call to action um, right up front when people hit your site. If things are buried under menus, quite often it, you, you're sort of going to dilute this opportunity for them to actually click on it. So it's important. Same as your information architecture and navigation comes into that. So why should you care? A simple fact is it will impact on the how successful your site is. It, there'll be an, definitely an impact on your uh, conversions and at the end of the day, when people hit your site, it's hard enough to get them there. You don't want to lose them once they, once they get there. So that's why, you know, a navigation, good navigation, a clear navigation is really important. Okay. So this is, you know, a lot, slab of text. Don't have to worry about it too much. But, you know, avoid confusing labels. So one of the things that, and this, these will be all available online too, by the way. I'll upload them to Meetup. Um, is things that are ambiguous. So items that you're not that you might be sure of what they mean, but your visitors might not be. So things like, you know, shop, shop locations, you know, these are sort of very common things that I see time and time again. So just make sure that if you look at your site, be very, um, you know, take a step back and make sure does all this stuff mean something? And, you know, nine times out of 10, there's optimization to be done on your own sites or your client sites. So make sure that you put a bit of extra time in doing it. Um, you know, keep simple terms, you know, avoid jargon. You know, quite often, you know, our clients or people that are really passionate about their particular business or service, they want to call it, you know, widget X and widget Y, whereas the average man in the street doesn't call, doesn't use that term. So use, um, you know, more sort of user-friendly uh, terms. And who's got some ideas on how we can find out what those terms are? There's a few different ways to do it. Any ideas on how, how you guys would go about, uh, you know, brainstorming with a client what are good menu items to use? 
Sorry? Porn. Yes, yep, so searching. Yep. yep, absolutely. Doing some research on social media. Contact. Yep, yep. So you can re research, but also one big thing, if you, especially if you're targeting search traffic, is to look at um, the keyword data. So look at something like Google um, AdWords tool, Keyword Planner, that tells you the volume of how many times people are searching uh, for a term per month based on a location. So you can actually find that people aren't searching for widget X and widget Y, they're searching for blah, which means you can make sure that you use that in your menu because it's going to be much more user friendly. And really we're talking about, we're not, we're not building sites for the search engines, we're making for the users, but we can get a lot of data from the search engines. Oops. Okay, so categories, again, this is something that when you, you know, if you're using WordPress, it's never too late to go back and, you know, refresh some of this stuff. You know, you can always change your menus, change categories, you know, change pages, that kind of thing. But make sure that you have a nice plan on where your content's going to sit and how it's all mapped out. Again, pretty important because, for, you know, from uh, a lot of different reasons, but you ideally want to make sure that your users can find your content because you put a lot of energy and effort into these things or the functionality of your site. Uh, so use keywords and, and phrases that we've mentioned that. Um, Multi-level menus. So, you know, some people really love the idea of being able to hover and then flow out and then hover and then, you know, you've got this big long thing, but it doesn't, you watch users use it and they, they struggle and they stumble on things, especially when you're talking about a device that's, that's not a desktop or a laptop. Uh, a tablet or a mobile, these sorts of menus very rarely um, end well. So you want to make sure that when you're doing menus with everything, as Warren said, you know, think mobile first, do a lot of testing, and you'll find that menus are the kind of things that quite often can trip people up. It might be responsive, but a really uh, fancy, over-ambitious menu can not necessarily translate so well to a mobile experience. Uh, use hover effects. So make sure that when you're hovering on a menu that people can actually see, especially if you've got a big, uh, you know, so, as we'll see a couple of examples of the mega menus, you want to make sure that, you know, if you hover and there's a big long list of things to select from, that people can easily see what they're going to click on. Because if, again, it's all about a positive user experience. A negative user experience will, uh, you know, increase your bounce rate and, uh, you know, impact your bottom line. Uh, think responsive. So the hamburger menu. So who's a fan of the hamburger menu? Is anyone sort of, you know, I, I see a lot of people going, eh, no. So, um, but I think the end, end of the day, it's, it's kind of what we've got. It's a convention and there's kind of like a religious war on whether, you know, the hamburger menu is good or bad. Um, the main thing is, I think, that from when we're thinking of mobile, that we actually do give people the options because a lot more people are using mobile devices. And check your stats and have a look. Um, simply hiding the menu because you're on a mobile device isn't necessarily a good solution. It's a bit of a hack. So some of the, the um, you know, workarounds I've seen is someone will have home or nav or, you know, menu next to that is sort of to explain to people because a lot of people don't know what that is, which is fine. Okay, so this is kind of a cool uh, quote. Um, someone from Smashing Magazine said, while content is supposed to be unique, surprising and exciting, um, navigating as a function or navigation is supposed to be simple and predictable. So it's not the time to start getting funky and have spinning flaming buttons and those sorts of things. You really want to try and uh, use something that's, you know, use conventions, use simple, clearly labeled terms for your navigation. Now, that doesn't mean if you've got something that's, you know, really cutting edge or experimental that you can have a bit of creativity, but generally speaking, this is kind of, you know, this is where you, you can try things and go nuts. This is where you want to try and at least make, have some consistency because people do expect conventions. And again, it's overall usability. And if you do user testing, there's a few different ways you can do that. You'll find that if you have some funky menus, people will, will trip up on them. Okay, so impact of theme uh, on your navigation options. So it's, you know, incredible. If you, have, if you pick the right theme, um, and, you know, I'm sort of in the camp of using sort of the premium themes as well, um, you have a lot more options. We know when it comes to the default WordPress, and then you've got something like this is a, not, uh, an example using Genesis, you have more options. And really it's all about, your menus are usually bits that are sort of styled. Um, and you know, some things will have multiple sp uh, spots, multiple menu locations. Um, but we can also put menus in widgets, which I'll get to as well. And one of the things you'll notice is that a lot of the free themes, um, they might 
they're very sort of, they might not be as flexible as some of the more premium options, which are more built with building blocks where you've got widgets in several places, which means you can put menus in several places. Okay, so creating and ordering pages. So you've probably seen this, you know, familiar with this. Um, you know, this is where we add our pages and we can order these pages and you can, I'll show you a couple of different uh, tricks you can do with that. So is anyone familiar with the screen, screen options? A little button in the top right hand corner of WordPress? Okay, so I'll show you quickly. I didn't um, put the slide in, but I will on the version that I upload. Uh, basically what it does is it lets, gives you some more options and it's context based. So if you're on pages or posts or menus, you, have, you can actually tick some options. By default, they're unchecked. But if you add them, it actually gives you a few more bits and pieces and th things to set in WordPress and menus, uh, including menus. So, um, you know, here's an example. It's a little bit washed out. Basically, what it says is you can use the number in the menu section to order your menus. There's a few other ways we'll show you with plugins as well, but I tend to use uh, that way. Okay, so appearance menus. We've all probably done this. You know, this is pretty simple kind of stuff. You know, you create your menu. Once you've got that there, you can pretty much add pages. You can add static links to other sites. So if you've got, you know, portfolio.yourdomainname.com, you can add a static link to that. So it doesn't have to be just content on your own site, but obviously, um, you know, pages and categories and links to anything on your site. So it could be a search, could be tags, could be anything. Um, so it doesn't have to be necessarily just pages and categories. There's quite a lot of flexibility there to do whatever you need. Um, and you're probably all aware of this, but once you've got your menu, you can drag out and it sort of has a bit of an indent and you can actually drag out different levels. And what that will do is it will give your menu uh, different levels. So if you haven't sort of played around with this, try it. It's very handy if you've got lots of content and you want to quickly uh, uh, set the hierarchy because you're probably familiar with pages, you have a hierarchy, parent and children. So there you go, second level and third level. Again, be careful about too many uh, levels. Um, and yes, so here's another thing you can do is customise the menu label. So this is going back to what we were saying before about shop, shop locations, buy, buy now, these sorts of labels. They have a huge impact on, on conversions. So when we do some sort of, you know, split testing and, you know, quite often the best way to make any decision for this sort of stuff is to get data behind you because no one really knows how a lot of that's, um, how a lot of these tests are going to pan out. Um, but yeah, definitely this is the sort of stuff if you're testing, make sure that you've, you know, try and always use the clearest, most concise, um, you know, user-friendly label. So theme location, so that basically, depending on your theme, again, this will vary on the themes that you have. And to sort of, um, you know, repeat what Warren said, depending on the, the quality of your theme and the way it's been built, the flexibility, this will... Uh, decide on what options you have for menus. So if you use something like, um, you know, a, a poorly developed theme, you won't, you just simply won't have the widget options and the menu locations there. So you can also, you know, more stuff about menu locations and there, you've created a menu, that's what it looks like. I'm not going to win any design awards, but that's okay. Um, as mentioned before, you know, let your sort of fonts, colours, these sorts of things are, are quite easy to change. You want a nice, clean, well-built, uh, you know, a foundation of a site to work with. So a quick, couple of quick plugins. So this is one, and there was, there's a lot of these, a few different ones, but basically what these are useful for is if you've got lots of pages. So if you've got dozens, maybe hundreds of pages of content and you need to, you know, rearrange them, going through the numbering, the order can get a bit tedious. So using stuff like this, you can actually drag and drop. So you've got all your stuff there in a, in a drag and drop um, you know, interface and it just saves time and it's easy, especially if you're moving things around constantly, you don't have to worry about going in and setting numbers. Um, there's quite a few of these. Uh, trying to think of the other ones. Anyway, we had Aaron who um, organised the dev meetup. He's demoed something similar uh, about a year ago. So it's in the archive somewhere. Okay, so how to add a custom link. Before we go on to that, just want to show... Okay, so this is the screen options. So you can't really see it very well, the projector's a bit washed out, but it's the bit that's next to help. So if you tick, if you drop down that, you'll see an option where you can add extra, you know, context-based for the menu section, 
where you can set links to open up in a new window. New window. You can also set um, CSS properties for that particular element, and also uh, I think there's XFN, which is the friend XML XHTML friend network or something. A few other sort of geeky things that I wouldn't really tick. But opening a new window is definitely something that you would clients will ask you to do. They want people to stay on their site and spawn a new browser. They make that decision for us, but that's okay. We we live with that. I'm not bitter at all. Okay, so adding a custom link. So that's something that you'll be doing commonly as well. So someone will say, in my menu, I want to link to our shop that's hosted on Big Commerce or Shopify or whatever. This is uh, where you do it. Change the label, um, good to go. That can be in a menu. So that's an example that it worked. Um, and you can create custom links for external URLs, pages, categories, tags. And if you've got custom post types, you can use that as well. So how to add a category. Again, if you need to sort of follow this stuff, there's a lot of resources, but I'll put it on Meetup. Uh, okay, so menu. So basically, there's a widget called custom menu that you can put anywhere that supports a widget, which hopefully, if you've got a good theme, you've got a few different widget options. You can put a menu wherever you want. So it's not uncommon if you've got a complex site to have menus in the sidebar, menus in the footer, not just your main top header navigation. Um, you know, people might even have you know, a menu above the header, below, and I think Genesis by default has most of those themes have uh, primary and a secondary, but also in your sidebar and your um, footer. So it's a good way of presenting your information. And I think a complex site or even, you know, moderately complex site, you need to start working out how you're going to display all this information. Burying it sort of deep in the site as sort of deep links um, isn't necessarily a great idea. You want to try and bring it to the surface. So this is how you do it. So appearance widgets, um, and you can drag them into the widget area. Again, a lot of people say, I don't have a widget in my sidebar or in my footer. It's, again, it's very much dependent on the theme that you have. So there, that's what it looks like. Uh, mega menus. So this is something that I thought I'd mention because uh, people love them. They are good if you're, if you're displaying a lot of information. Um, basically, this is the sort of stuff that, that I'm sure that you've seen. You go to a site and you're presented with a very big sort of either full page or you know partial page um, menus. Who likes these? Does anyone like them, think they're good? They're sort of, yeah, everyone's like, you know, yeah. It, they, they solve a problem, okay? And, and I think the thing is if you're, you know, again, if you're looking at different cars and you've got all the different cars, it's sort of easier than, you know, it's instant. You don't have to go into the page about cars. So done right, I think they can work okay. Um, but there's, you know, you'll be definitely come across projects where you'll be working with these. Okay, so there's an example. You know, that's what it looks like. You've seen this big, big thing. Sometimes they even cover the whole page. Um, and to achieve that, there's a few different ways to do it, but um, I've tended to use plugins. Um, this is a particularly popular one. Uh, there's also, you know, these. Again, do your searching. Go with what's actively developed, what's actively supported. Ask people, you know, at meetups like this, what they use. Um, anyone else use anything other than, than these ones? This is kind of, it's kind of easy to work with, kind of reliable. They're handy, though. More. I've got some articles. Um, and you can contact me, and I'll upload the slides. So any questions about menus that anyone has? It's not the most sort of uh, sexy topic, but... No, no, go for it. Very good. Thanks, Samila. Yep. So, I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, we sort of have this um, 
I think doing like SEO audits and trying to improve site performance is if you could change one thing with the site, what would you change? And quite often it's the site structure. And a lot of that depends on your menu, but it's also your content, and it's also the sort of, you know, the user experience and the design of the theme. So it's all kind of tied into the same thing, but definitely don't um, forget about it, you know? Geek out on menus and make sure that, you know, you put a bit of time into them because they're important. So it's like eating your veggies. Make sure you, you know, do your, make sure you set up your menus right. So cool. All right, I'll hand over to Amelia. Thanks, everyone.